everybody. I'm going to be speaking about mood protest as a form of resistance to Islam, the veil, and Islamism. And I think it's an important vehicle, actually, to oppose religion as well as the religious right. And of course, all religions have a disturbing view Ooh, there it goes. Um, of the female body. As I've said before, religion should come with a health warning, like cigarettes, religion kills. And of course, Islam is no different, except, as we spoke about earlier today on the panel, uh, except for the fact that it's the banner of a regressive political movement, which has state power and influence. And so misogyny is encouraged and directly imposed by the state. It's like Christianity during the Inquisition, making it a very dangerous phenomenon. Under Sharia law, for example, a woman's testimony is worth half that of a man's. You can't travel without the permission of a male guardian. And there's gender apartheid, similar to racial apartheid, but based on segregation of the sexes. Certain fields of study are close to women. And you can't take certain jobs, like being a judge, for example, because women are too emotional. Girls from puberty onwards can be married. They're considered women. They have to be veiled. And they can be sentenced as adults. Veiling is compulsory where Sharia law is the law of the land. And women are often detained for improper or bad veiling, as it's called, by morality police. Here's some women being taken away by the morality police in Iran. And those who transgress the sort of Islamist norms are often, they can face imprisonment, flogging, and even stoning to death. And what's, what's outrageous is the fact that stoning isn't outlawed in a place like Iran. The size of the stone is. So it can't be too big so that it kills too quickly, and it can't be too small so that it takes too much time and they get bored with the act. Now, according to this view, the ideal, the ideal woman is obedient, properly veiled, submissive, and accepting of her assigned place in society. The rest are whores. And women are often compared to unwrapped sweets. Here's a billboard in Iran where it says the veil is a type of protection or security for women. Women are seen to be the source of fitna or chaos in society. And according to Muhammad, Islam's prophet, there is no greater fitna for men than women. And women are blamed for every calamity and natural disaster, disobedient women, as well as the disintegration of the family and society and deserving of punishment in order to maintain national and Islamic values, pride and honor. And of course, you don't have to look very far for evidence of this. Women protesters in Tahrir Square in Egypt, for example, are given virginity tests, and they're routinely blamed for the sexual assault and rape that they face. In Tunisia, the Islamists often use violence to correct the behavior of wayward women. And in Iran, women are routinely arrested or harassed by morality police for acts against chastity. Islamism's obsession with women's bodies and its insistence that women be veiled and hidden from view means that nudity is an important form of public resistance. Islamists want us bound in body bags and not seen and not heard. We refuse to comply. A nude woman is the antithesis of the ideal, veiled, and submissive woman. It says loud and clear, a woman's body isn't obscene, veiling it is. Religious misogyny is. <laughs> of course, nude protest is not the only way to resist Islamism and the veil but it is a very modern, practical, and appropriate way of doing so. It challenges also discrimination against women and a system which profits from the commodification and sexualization of women's bodies. Detractors will argue that nude protests play in the hands of sexists 
by further commodifying the female body. They're mistaken. The problem is the erroneous conflation of nudity and obscenity, pornography, vulgarity, and immorality, which buys into the attitude that female bodies only serve as titillation for the male gaze. They see a nude protester and cannot see beyond her tits and ass. The idea that the female body is shameful, dishonorable, gross, crude, fits within this debased view of women's bodies. The shocked outrage at nudity reflects this discomfort with the female body, rather than any real problematic with nude protest itself. There is nothing wrong with nudity in and of itself. That the female body is used for profit, sexualized and commodified, doesn't make the female body obscene any more than it makes breastfeeding in public vulgar. Here's a photo of protesters in Britain who came out breastfeeding en masse after a woman breastfeeding was called a tramp. Commodification relies on an objectified image that's separate from the reality of women's lives, bodies, and minds, and which is used to regulate, control, and suppress. Whilst Islamists often portray their rule as a prescription for the debasement of women in Western societies, their image of women is the ultimate in objectification. In fact, from early on, girls are over-sexualized with the imposition of child veiling and child marriages. This viewpoint also sees men as rapists, unable to control their urges. The actuality and frankness of women's bodies as a form of protest challenges this negative image of females, turns it on its head, and undermines the limits of what is deemed socially acceptable. It's subversive and it threatens the status quo. This is very different from pornography, which is widespread in the Middle East and North Africa. In fact, the more overtly religion and state intertwine, the more chauvinistic the society and the more pervasive and blatant are pornography, sex assaults, harassment and violence against women. It's nudity as protest and outside these socially accepted limits of the woman as either whore or submissive that so enrages. As Soraya Shamali writes, when women refuse to sexualize themselves and use their bodies to challenge powerful interests that profit from that sexualization, the words we should be using aren't lewd and obscene, they're threatening and destabilizing. Women who use public nudity for social commentary, art, and protest are myth-busting along many dimensions. Active, not passive. Strong, not vulnerable. Together, not isolated. Public, not private. And usually angry, very angry, not alluring. The morality offense is misogyny, not nudity. Nude protest makes women visible in the public space and redefines who controls the female body. It's the reclamation of a tool used for suppression and an assistance that our bodies are not owned by anyone, not the source of anyone's honor, shame, or national embarrassment. They belong to us. Claiming nudity by women has special meaning under circumstances where bodies, women's bodies have been abused or raped as weapons of war or repression. In Iran, for example, you must have heard of the girls, the virgin girls who were raped before execution in order to prevent them from going to heaven. And in Algeria, the armed Islamic Front carried out mass rapes in the 90s as part of its terror campaign. In response, nudity has often been used to confront armed and repressive forces from the Indian subcontinent to Africa. Nude protest is not just confined to the West. Some of the most famous examples of nude protest are from elsewhere. Of course, the famous Alia Magda El Mahdi, the Egyptian atheist blogger and student who posted a nude photo of herself as a scream against misogyny. She wrote on her blog, 
try nude models who worked in fine arts faculties in the early 70s, hide all art books and smash naked archaeological statues. She was alluding to some protest by Islamists against these statues. Then take off your clothes and look at yourself in the mirror. Burn your body that you so despise to get rid of your sexual complexes forever before subjecting me to your bigoted insults or denying me my freedom of expression. Alia, of course, was kidnapped, threatened by Islamists, and had to free the country. The other well-known case is that of Amina Sabui in Tunisia. She posted this photo of herself, which says in Arabic, my body is not the source of anyone's honor. Islamic cleric called for her flogging and stoning, and he said her actions would bring misfortune by causing disease and disasters and epidemics and could be contagious and give ideas to other women. Contagious indeed. Of course, to which Amina brilliantly responded, fuck your morals. <laughs> She too was beaten, given a virginity test, she's a, she's a, a public atheist. She was uh, taken to uh, imams to try to take her back and away from atheism. She was imprisoned for, uh, for um, a few months until an international campaign helped to get her release and now she, she's had to leave the country. And of course there have been many others, Ai Weiwei, the wonderful Chinese artist, um, a lot of his fans took nude photos of themselves to express their contempt for the state after the Chinese government accused the artist of pornography for his nude photo. Recently in Argentina, an estimated 7,000 women, sorry, many of them topless, stormed the cathedral in defense of reproductive rights. There was the Bare Botoks women's protest, which took place in Swaziland in 2000, to protest evictions by the king's brother. Hundreds of women in the Niger Delta staged a topless protest against the non-implementation of an existing agreement by Shell. In March of last year, a women's group in Orissa, India, staged a semi-nude protest against land acquisition for a proposed steel plant. And this I just found out today. On April 15th, and a woman in Iran was photographed walking nude in the night down the street. And uh, we don't know who she is. That was just a few days ago. And the Iranian newspapers have basically, uh, you know, there's been a lot of outrage by the state on her action. She hasn't been found, obviously, otherwise she, wouldn't, she, she would be in prison right now. Uh, and they've said, how long are we going to accept women like this doing the devil's work? There have been nude protests in many places for everything from opposing the war, opposing wars to defending the environment. Nude protest aids in the fight for women's liberation in one of the key battlefields, our bodies. And whilst women's oppression, in my opinion, is fundamentally a product of the economic and social system, which benefits from the commodification and objectification of women, as well as sexual divisions in the production process, it's also the product of religious values and chauvinistic traditions and beliefs. Nude protest challenges the status quo. An incidental positive outcome of this form of protest is a more open and relaxed attitude towards nudity. But nude protest is a means of political protest that goes beyond the issue of nudity. It challenges discrimination with important implications for other aspects of women's lives, much of which have to do with control and suppression. There are those who will say there are many more important fights for justice other than nudity. That's something some women's rights campaigners from Iran will say to me, for example. But I think when they say this, they miss an important point. A woman's control over her own body translates into her being considered a real and distinct human being, separate from the men who are deemed to own her. This translates into more freedoms, such as the freedom to study what she wants, work where she wants, visit friends and family when she wants, 
travel without permission when she wants, have sex with whom she wants, have the right to divorce and child custody, marry who she wants, choose to be an atheist if she wants, and refuse sex when she wants, as well as to have the right to food and clothing and health care, irrespective of how she is perceived by her male guardians or the society. In a society where women have ownership of their bodies, everything from veiling to FGM to stonings to honor killings become impermissible. If the measure of a society's freedom is based on women's freedom, then nudity as a political challenge is an important one. Detractors who argue that nude protest pushes the women's liberation backwards equate women's nudity with obscenity and indignity and cannot see its political, revolutionary, table-breaking, liberating, and deeply humanizing effects. And of course, the closer the nudity, the more uncomfortable it becomes. For many Egyptians, Ali Magda El Mahdi was said to have embarrassed the Egyptian revolution. The Muslim Brotherhood did that. Amina Sabui was blamed for pushing back the Tunisian women's liberation movement. And I have been accused of many things, including pushing back the women's liberation movement in Iran and putting women's rights campaigners there at risk. No repressive regime needs excuses to suppress and deny the rights of women. It is absurd to blame the Islamic regime of Iran's misogyny on those of us who resist. Being on the left as well, I have been accused of embarrassing the poor left, which will apparently face further accusations of immorality as a result of my nudity. Nothing, nothing brings out the misogynists from their hiding places, both right and left, better than nudity. This discomfort means that the same rules don't seem to apply when it comes to an analysis of nude protest. The Ukrainian uprising revolution isn't denigrated for being white and Western, but we often hear that criticism of feminine, whatever you think of that group. And they're often referred to in that way. We often hear about the small number of nude protesters, when what matters are not numbers per se, but significance and effect. Many taboo-breaking protests and demands were raised and organized by a minority and avant-garde who first led the way. Also, geographical location, not politics, is stressed when it comes to nude protests. Distinctions are made, for example, between nude protests in Egypt or Tunisia versus that in Stockholm or Paris. Now, on March 8th, International Women's Day, I joined Egyptian blogger Alia Magda El Mahdi and Tunisian topless activist Amina Sabui and others in a protest in Paris in front of the Louvre for a, uh, a, against the subhuman status of women in the Middle East and North Africa, along with Mariam Russell, who considers herself a Muslim still, as well as Safiya Lebdi and Solma Zwakifu, all ex-Muslim atheists. We carried flags of the various countries we come from. We were all ex-Muslim atheist women from the Middle East and North Africa. But rather than carry a flag of the Islamic regime of Iran, which I can't stand, I decided to cut out the Allah from the flag and place my vulva there instead. <laughs> What, what one blogger called Pussy Riot Iranian style. <laughs> the actions of Islamists have global impact, and so does nude protest, irrespective of where it takes place. Our nude protest on 8th March in Paris has been hotly debated from Tehran to Calcutta and London, and Islamists, in fact, have rioted in Calcutta when photos of our protest was published in a local paper. If Occupy Wall Street can take the form and content of Tahrir Square, why not nude protest? In fact, the material basis of the protests, including nudity, are similar. 
those who fail to see the importance of nude protests, addressing deep-seated and deep-rooted discrimination against women, don't see the discrimination in the first place. Even in a majority of Western countries, women cannot appear topless in beaches or parks as can men. Breastfeeding in many public places is still considered taboo. Facebook doesn't allow nipples. Free the nipple is a campaign against Facebook. Earlier this year, Facebook temporarily shut down a French museum's page after it managed to show nipples in one of its paintings. And recently, a French politician called for censoring of a children's book called Everyone Get Naked, which shows people from all walks of life taking off their clothes in order to help calm children's fears about their own bodies. This is a photo of some writers protesting the call for a ban. At our 8th March nude protest with Amina and Alia in Paris, no less, we were kettled in with hun uh, maybe a hundred police surrounding the place. We were shouted at, grabbed, and arrested. At the station, the police wrote down all our personal details, the slogans we had on our bodies, what we chanted, and we were held for several hours and chastised for wasting police time. These all give nude protests universal significance. Detractors who criticize nude protests taking place in the West, they ignore the real risks for those who do nude protests in places like Egypt and Tunisia. Alia Magda El Mahdi and Amina Sabui both had to leave their countries. Critics have dared me to hold my 8th March protest in Paris in Azadi Square in Tehran. And if I could, I would do it there. But it would mean a death sentence. This type of criticism is akin to telling exiled political opponents that they must either remain silent or dissent in their countries of origin, even if it means death. It ignores the repression that many of us have fled from and the real risks involved in any form of protest against Islamism, especially new protest, even when it is done outside of the Middle East and North Africa. Opponents have called our new protest offensive and culturally inappropriate. And have you noticed how they're never offended by stoning and FGM and all the other violence that takes place against women? But anything that breaks taboos and demands fundamental change will offend existing sensibilities and will be deemed inappropriate for its time. Even so, not everyone is offended. Whilst there are many who condemn it, there are also many um, from, from the smallest villages in Iran who vehemently defend it and support it. They said they would do it if they could as well. No culture and no society is homogeneous. Those who consider nude protest as foreign and culturally inappropriate are only considering Islamism's sensibilities and values and not that of the many of us who resist. In the same way, there are opponents of nude protest and supporters of the veil and Sharia law right here in the West. There are also supporters of nude protest and opponents of the veil in the East. As I said in my earlier panel, reaction or enlightenment is not stitched into people's DNA. It's about choice and politics. In fact, you know, I really strongly believe even more so because you will really not find any greater opposition to Islamism and Sharia law than those who have to suffer under it, live under it, and resist against it. The, so the call for a free, equal, and autonomous women is also a call for a free Iran, Middle East, and North Africa. No society, no society can be free without women being free. When it is a crime to be a woman under Islam and Islamism, nude protest is an important political challenge. As the Marxist Mansur Hikmat said, in his Islam, be it true or untrue, the individual has no rights or dignity. In Islam, the woman is a slave. In Islam, the child is on par with animals. 
In Islam, free thinking is a sin deserving of punishment. Music is corrupt. Sex without permission and religious justification is the greatest of sins. This is a religion of death. In reality, all religions are such, but most religions have been restrained by free thinking and freedom-loving humanity over hundreds of years. This one was never restrained or controlled. With every move, it brings abominations and miseries. Nude protest is part of the effort to restrain and push back Islam and Islamism. It says loud and clear, no more, enough. I will be nude, I will protest, and I will challenge you to your core. Thank you.